As our starting point today, I would like to reflect a little on the soul's progress through successive lives on earth. Your studies of anthroposophy have familiarized you with the basic phenomena involved. But today let us speak of a few things that require deeper and more detailed consideration. When a person passes through the gate of death, he first lays aside his physical body, of course. In this state he initially possesses what we call the I, with its whole content, and then the astral body, and also the etheric body, albeit the latter only for a short period. This period, during which we still possess the etheric body, is a time when we look back on our recently ended life on earth. Our whole life appears before our soul in vivid pictorial form. This phase ends when the etheric body is divested upward, out into the cosmos, in the same way that our physical body was divested downward into the earth. Then we remain with our astral body, which certainly still contains the after-effects of the etheric body, and thus all that this astral body experienced by virtue of being connected with the etheric body and also with the physical body in our last life. As you know, this astral body is not divested until a longer period has passed. In our literature, I've pointed out that we ought not to speak of a radical dissolution of the etheric and astral bodies, for this dissolution, in reality, is an emergence of the powers within us into the universe. We can say that the etheric body bears within it everything inscribed into it by all that we have experienced during our lifetime, as a sum of what I would call formative patterns. This sum of formative patterns increasingly spreads out and is in fact inscribed into the cosmos. And thus what occurred in our life and is inscribed in the etheric body does actually work on as forces in the universe. Our conduct in relation to the etheric body is something we give up to the cosmos. Our life is not irrelevant to the cosmos. And this is where anthroposophic spiritual science can give us a sense of great responsibility. That what we etherically embody in our intellect, feeling, will and morality will be communicated to and will inform the cosmos can certainly give us pause for thought. The cosmos contains, if you like, the acts of those who lived in past times. The conduct of our lives as this has worked through into a configuring of the etheric body, separates from us in a sense and accumulates in the greater, wider world. Basically, we help create the world. And when we know what, and when we know that we do so as co-creators of the world, we will feel great responsibility. The astral body that we continue to carry with us is likewise not something we should regard as simply dissolving and dispersing into the universe. This is not true. It likewise informs the universe, although in this case the spirit and soul realm of the cosmos. Now when the I has separated from this astral body, once our passage through the soul world has concluded, you can say that what we have incorporated into our astral body is now out there in the universe. We go our separate ways. The astral body pursues its own paths separately from the eye, which likewise continues its journey. But it is not true to say that the astral body vanishes altogether. On the contrary, this astral body evolves further and in its reciprocal relationship with the universe, becomes a factor there simply in consequence of our implanting in it particular moral impulses, so that in the shape it has acquired through this action of our moral impulses, it informs the universe, as it were embedding itself in the universe of spirit and soul. It is even true to say, albeit 
in semi-pictorial form, that this astral body increasingly expands, but then its expansion reaches certain limits beyond which it cannot go, and then begins to contract once more. And the speed or slowness with which it unfolds or contracts is essentially dependent on what we incorporated into it during our life. Thus the astral body informs the universe, coming up against the boundary, if I can put it like this, of our soul's spiritual cosmos, and then being repelled again. Meanwhile, the eye pursues its paths in a world that is really very different. But inwardly this eye develops what one can call a kind of desire, as I expressed it in yesterday's public lecture. And really it is this desire which feels itself drawn again to the astral body as the latter contracts again, having, however, become somewhat different in nature. A kind of reuniting occurs between the altered, metamorphosed astral body and the eye. It is due to this reconnection that the human soul acquires specific inclinations as the time approaches for it to return to the earth. If we study the whole human being, his totality, we can in fact trace in his outer form how the astral body has expanded into the universe and returns, and how the eye once again finds it and reunites with it. To do this we have to picture how in the form we appear on earth at birth. We are really constituted of two different aspects. The astral body I described as expanding into the universe and returning encounters the I again. In pictorial terms, the astral body approaches the I as a kind of hollow sphere, growing ever smaller as it does so. It is related to the planetary system. The I, as it develops between death and a new birth, yearns for the astral body, but it yearns still more for a particular region of the earth, a nation, and a family. And the transformed astral body, as it returns from outer expanses, contracts and unites with what the eye has now become after its passage between death and a new birth, along with its strong attraction to the earth and to nation, family, and so forth. In turn, we can see what these forces of the transformed astral body have brought about when we observe the newborn baby's body surface. What is configured, in a sense, from the skin inward, including the sensory organs, is configured by the wider cosmos. But what arises organically due to the eye feeling itself connected with the earth, feeling drawn to the earth, is something that the organism creates, by contrast, from within outward, as it forms the bones, muscles, and so on. In other words, this flows from within to meet what enters, streaming inward from the skin and the senses. We are configured out of the cosmos as far as the outer surface of our corporeality is concerned, whereas the earth configures us from within, in relation to what streams through the eye itself, growing outward to encounter development of the skin and the senses. Thus the human being is really born out of the cosmos, and his sojourn in the womb, one can say, merely offers him the opportunity for these two powers, a macrocosmic and a microcosmic one, to connect with each other. We are beings that do not grow, as it were, out of a dot or speck from the germinal embryo, but rather we are a confluence of non-telluric, super-terrestrial powers on the one hand, which our transformed astral body makes cohere, and what grows from the earth to meet these super-terrestrial powers. What we call our intellect, our powers of reason, our thinking capacity, is intimately connected with what we acquire, what grows into us from the cosmos. This thinking faculty of ours 
points us back to our previous life on earth, and we acquire it by virtue of the astral fabric we created in that previous life and its subsequent expansion into and return from the cosmos. This now, in a sense, seeks out our head, largely formed from without as a sense and skin organ, to configure and act within it. The rest of the organism of skin and senses is only an adjunct to the head. By contrast, our will organization comes to expression more in what has an affinity with earthly forces, since the human eye, as it approaches birth, feels itself drawn to a particular point on the earth. At birth, therefore, the heavens give us reason and the earth gives us our will. Feeling, intermediary between them, is given us neither by heaven nor earth, but exists in and depends on the continual back and forth between earth and heaven. Its external organ is our rhythmic system, the circulatory and respiratory system, and so on. This lies midway between the head organism per se, issuing from the macrocosm via the former astral body, and what earth endows us with, our will organization. Our rhythmic system lies between these two, with our life of feeling that can unfold on the foundation of this rhythmic system. This is also the realm which, if you like, we can realize and bring to outward visibility between heaven and earth. Our head points more toward our superterrestrial origin. Our will is intimately connected with what earth gives us. Between these two is our life of feeling, and in physical terms our circulation and breathing. A view that encompasses the whole human being will be neither one-sidedly psyche nor body-oriented, but will see that both of these, physical body and soul, interact and play into each other. At the same time, this also shows us that in our connection with the whole macrocosm, specifically in our head organism, we carry in us something formed and configured by the macrocosm, and that this points us back into our past. We see that our intellect is altogether past-related, though in our ordinary awareness we do not realize that this aspect of us points us back to our former lives on earth. Pupils of the initiates in ancient oriental centers of wisdom sought first to establish a connection between their rhythmic life and that of their head. In those days when ancient oriental wisdom was evolving, it was quite natural and self-evident to seek higher schooling by making the breathing process conscious, and thus also the circulatory process, to breathe in in a particular intentional way, and thus raise breathing and circulation into awareness. In the ancient Orient, people were capable of doing this because their soul and spirit were not yet so intensely bound to the body as is the case today. It would more or less spell the ruination of the body to practice this now anachronistic ancient oriental method for attaining higher knowledge, for this would mean intervening too deeply in the health of the body. This is because we are nowadays more closely and intimately bound up with the body than was the case, for example, in times of ancient Indian wisdom. But someone who practiced such exercises in ancient India achieved the following. He made the breathing process conscious. In other words, he breathed in consciously and by doing so acquired the possibility of gradually observing the process unfolding through pressure of the in-breath in which the cerebrospinal fluid oscillates through the spinal column toward the brain, in a sense lapping at the brain itself. And ideas, thoughts arise when the cerebrospinal fluid thus engages with the solid parts of the brain, rising or shooting upward on the in-breath and sinking again on the out-breath. The way thoughts arise is actually far more complex than people imagine nowadays, when everything conforms with the materialistic schema. 
Today people think of thinking, or rather they did until recently, for today people are again relinquishing clear and precise ideas, in terms of some kind of evolution by means of which nerves form the basis of our thinking faculty. That is nonsense. Instead, the cerebrospinal fluid continually laps at the nervous system, giving rise to neural processes which underlie and sustain the forces at work in the nervous system. The pupil of ancient Indian wisdom became aware of this, and in doing so he also experienced that what formed his brain directed him back to former lives. In a sense he used his present rhythmic system to sense his last life, to feel it as a certainty. For an initiation pupil of the time, therefore, it was self-evident that he had had a former life. He perceived it by raising the breathing process into conscious activity. In our times, this must be done in a different way. It can no longer be accomplished, as I discussed in the public lecture, by meditation based on a special configuration of the breathing process, which is not something modern people should do, but one based instead on a calm dwelling on ideas or images thus proceeding from the opposite direction. This makes allowance for the fact that we are more closely bound up with our physical body today. By dwelling upon thoughts, thus coming from the opposite direction, we can learn to know this quality of the rhythmic system from a soul-spiritual perspective. We acquaint ourselves with the other aspect of the process, now no longer penetrating deeper into the body, as people did in ancient India, which we should not do since we are already deeply enough immersed in it, but by freeing ourselves from the body. Thus in the realm of spirit and soul we can now approach the whole cosmos and discover there how our past life on earth is connected with this present life. The insights of anthroposophy are not abstract fanatical statements, but arise as a thorough inside-out knowledge of the human organism. This is a living knowledge that comes from within rather than from without, and is therefore not gained by external examination of the body as a sort of corpse, or not a corpse perhaps, yet still from an external angle, but by coming to know the human being from within, and really acquainting oneself with this reciprocal effect between the rhythmic and the nervous system on the one hand and the rhythmic system and the system of metabolism on the other, with this intimate contact between them, for the rhythmic system does also impact on the metabolic system. If we learn to grasp this interaction between the rhythmic system and the system of metabolism, we discover as assured reality that the germ of our next life on earth already lies within us. In its spiritual aspect, the metabolism holds the seeds of our future life on earth. While it is in this life the lowest rung in the human organism, in its spiritual aspect it nevertheless contains the seeds for our future life on earth. In this way we can rise to observation and understanding of the whole human being. You see, in this respect, Those who subscribe fully to Western cultural values are rather like a blind man's experience of color. What I will say now may seem alien to many of you, but I still want to mention it. Everything of a mathematical nature that we concern ourselves with, thus involving linear forms, angles, vertical and horizontal, everything we measure, is elaborated from within us and underlies our inner experience. The moment we gain insight into what underlies our inner life, we are no longer governed by Kantian ideas, merely taking what burgeons within us and molding it into some uncomprehending phrase, such as that mathematics is a priori knowledge. This phrase simply means something pre-exists. If we learn inner vision, then we know that this remarkable mathematical faculty comes from the astral body, which has passed through the mathematics of the whole cosmos and then contracts it again. 
We simply allow something to surface from our soul, which we experienced in a former incarnation, which has passed through the whole cosmos and then surfaces in the subtlety of mathematical and geometrical lines and forms. And then you find that the term a priori expresses a view of the world that more or less corresponds with a blind man's sense of color. If this were not the case, the Kantian a priori would be known to originate in our former incarnations, appearing again in this incarnation in metamorphosed form, having, in the meanwhile, passed through the cosmos. So here we discover the lawfulness that underlies our whole being, and which becomes apparent when we observe the human entelechy passing through repeated lives on earth. Our modern culture is very disinclined to take account of such things, and contemporary world views really therefore only grasp externalities. I'd like to illustrate this with an example. Take the customary way of considering a particular people in a particular geographical location in the world. What do historians do here? They see the current generation and say that an earlier one preceded it and then others before this. Tracing history back like this, we arrive in earlier centuries, in the medieval period, say, tracing bloodlines down through the generations in terms of physically inherited characteristics. And then it is assumed that the nature of this people today originates in its earlier developmental history. That is the modern historical approach. When a, professional, when a professional historian studies German, French, or English history, trying to trace its origins back as far as possible, he does so by studying physically inherited traits through the generations and seeking to understand the characteristics of parent in a contemporary generation in terms of what earlier generations of this nation experienced. Thus, he is concerned with physically inherited attributes. Yet this is just overlaying history with a materialistic outlook. If by contrast you consider what anthroposophic spiritual science offers, not just theoretically, but as something really applicable to life, applied to current realities, then you do something other than just speculating about repeated lives on earth. Do more than look in isolation at the fact that your soul passed through former lives and will pass through future ones. You have to observe what is actually present in the world. It is not that a current generation cannot also be described in terms of bloodline and physical characteristics passed down through generations, which possibly lived in the same geographical location, or perhaps also migrated from elsewhere at some point. Yet this is to remain solely in the physical material domain. This is not the whole story. Here we have a generation of people before us, living in the present day, whose physical corporeality originates from ancestors. But the souls living in each individual member of this society may well have nothing at all to do with these ancestors. The soul itself did not undergo or experience on earth what occurred through many successive generations of this nation, as only the outward destiny of a people. Instead, the soul witnessed this in the world of spirit from the perspective of life between death and a new birth. You see, we can look back to our grandfather, great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather. When they were alive, we had not yet been born and our soul was still in the world of spirit. We inherited our body from them, but our soul inherited nothing from any of them. During their lifetimes, the soul was living in a quite different world, and its experiences may well have nothing at all to do with what our body inherited from our forefathers. An outward paradox often arises here when we inquire into such things by spiritual research. In general, we have to realize that mere speculation about life's realities and abstract philosophizing often produces nothing but nonsense. Only true perception of these realities will reveal the truth. 
A spiritual researcher is often himself surprised by his findings. And in fact, the surprise he feels can often be a kind of confirmation, since he had thought everything out before since if he had thought everything out beforehand, such confirmation would not impress itself on him so strongly. The very fact that things are mostly quite other than abstract thought would often conceive them can usually tell us that in pursuing a true science of the spirit we are not in a subjective but an objective realm. Here we discover something I touched on previously relating to humanity's history. I am not going to correct what I said before but it does need enlarging on but this is a very complex field of study. In the past we saw, and this is largely correct, certainly, that the souls of numerous individuals amongst the population of Europe lived in the South at an earlier period, the early Christian era, and now tend to be incarnated more in the North, or in Europe in general, but tending toward northern regions. This is certainly the case. Yet it does not encompass the majority of the population, and we do need to look elsewhere to acquaint ourselves with the full reality. In studying the majority of Western European and also Central European populations through into Russia, spiritual scientific research leads us back to times when the Europeans of those days invaded and conquered the indigenous inhabitants of America. This Native American population possessed remarkable inner qualities of soul. We will fail to do justice to such things if, egoistically hammering on about our lofty culture, we regard the life of such indigenous people as mere barbarism instead of perceiving the distinctive otherness of a people such as this, which was conquered and eradicated after America was discovered. The bird's-eye view of our, in quotes, higher culture will blind us to such qualities. These original inhabitants of America, the Native American tribes, had remarkable pantheistic sensibilities and and worshipped a great spirit who infuses all things. Their souls were filled with an intense faith in this all-pervading great spirit. Due to everything relating to these people's life of feeling, Their souls were predestined to spend only a relatively short time between their death and a new birth. But the affinity that had formed between them and their territory and soil, their whole surroundings, and also the circumstances of their fate, of being uprooted and eradicated, all had a decisive effect on their life between death and a new birth. This led to what sounds like a paradox, yet is a fact. The majority of Western and Central Europeans, reaching eastward too, not all of them but a large proportion, originate in terms of physical inheritance from medieval ancestors, but are inhabited by souls that previously lived in Native American bodies. However paradoxical this sounds, it is true for the majority of Europeans. The experience of these souls and their deep affinity with the Great Spirit entered into reciprocal relationship with outward linear historical development which the child imbibes with his mother's milk and then through imitation internalizes and reproduces outwardly again. What we absorb in this way is largely absorbed from without and here an interaction occurs between this and what originates in the soul from former incarnations. We do not understand European life if we consider it in terms only of a one-sided reality, of traits inherited from ancestors, but when we know instead where these souls come from who have then intermingled with these inherited traits in mutual interplay. The historical reality that has arisen in Europe has only come about as the fruit of this interaction between the nature of souls originating in past incarnations and what these souls have appropriated through inheritance and also education and upbringing in the broadest sense. At the same time, these souls live alongside others 
who formerly inhabited southern lands in the early Christian centuries, and then later incarnated again in Western and Eastern Europe. Everything that has occurred in society, especially and increasingly in our current catastrophic era, shows us that the reality of life in Europe is complex, and the spiritual researcher finds that it has been rendered complex especially by the fact that reincarnated Native American souls have united with inherited traits of the diverse nationalities, and so forth. Against this we must set a certain thread in the population of Europe, whose souls we encounter in the early Christian centuries, the period of migrations, as professional historians call it. This was a European population of the time whose barbarian tribes coming from the south had absorbed Christianity and shaped it in a way quite different from the way it had developed, for instance, in Greek or Roman culture at the very beginning of the Christian era. These souls of the migration period and of subsequent centuries were formatively influenced by the Christianity pushing northward from the south, as well as still bearing their original characteristics and predisposition. It is important to realize that this population of Europe, which absorbed Christianity during the migration period, allowed very distinctive characteristics to surface. These people had a strong tendency to configure their physical organism in a way that enabled their individual eye consciousness to manifest with special vehemence. And this eye consciousness, combined with the selfless, excuse me, selflessness of Christianity, so that the soul was configured in a particular way. These souls absorbed Christianity a couple of centuries or so after it was first established. The large proportion of Europeans, by contrast, now embody souls in whom Christianity is inculcated from without, through education and upbringing, but also through feelings innate in their physically inherited bodies. These souls had learned nothing of Christianity in their former life in America. It is infinitely illuminating to picture the relationship of our modern Europeans to Christianity by discovering that most of these souls learned nothing at all about Christianity in their former incarnations. Instead, Christianity is something they have absorbed from without, an ongoing tradition passing down the generations. On the other hand, the souls who became acquainted with Christianity's first developments, its earliest period, have tended to incarnate in modern times, in the present day specifically, in more eastern regions, in Asia. And thus, for these Christianized souls, the pendulum is now swinging back the other way, so that they come to absorb what remained in the Orient of ancient Oriental traditions, albeit now in decadent form. If we study the Japanese through spiritual science, we find that many of their reincarnated souls formerly lived in Europe during the migration period. When we know something like this, we can gain more insight into certain outstanding figures. Try to understand the remarkable person Rabindranath Tagore with this in mind. The Orientalism he has by upbringing specifically from Indian culture, is something inherited. He acquired it through inheritance and upbringing. This is largely a declining culture, and this is why it displays such a whimsical character. In a sense, Tagore's writings are extremely whimsical in character. Yet when reading Tagore, the European feels a warm glow pervading what comes to whimsical expression, and this is because, in a former incarnation, his soul lived amongst a people that absorbed Christianity. You see, people do not regard the world in a less abstract way because they are materialists than they do if they subscribe to any other outlook alien to life. We cannot fully understand modern humankind if we take account only of blood relationships and genetic descent and fail to consider what souls bring with them from past incarnations which connects to form a whole with outward heredity, outward upbringing. 
The whole nature and configuration of these souls who lived in Europe during the migration period, and above all the fact that they had been Christianized, meant that they would inevitably spend a longer period between death and a new birth. Then, too, in studying the present day, the spiritual investigator is led back to periods either a little before or after the mystery of Golgotha, or at the time it actually occurred. In Asia, of course, the population knew nothing of the mystery of Golgotha. And yet their oriental wisdom, all that developed in the Orient in the form of devotional wisdom, in a sense prepared people to understand Christianity. The mystery of Golgotha exists as fact, intrinsic reality, and different ages can grasp it in the most diverse ways. The early centuries of Greek and Roman culture after Christ applied to this mystery of Golgotha a wisdom originating in the Orient. The concepts and ideas which they used to grasp Christ's incarnation in Jesus of Nazareth had come to them from Oriental wisdom. But people in Asia, living before and after the mystery of Golgotha, were endowed with a creative power of much greater vitality, albeit also more nebulous, than you find in the Orient today. These people living in Asia then, at least a large number of them, are today incarnated amongst the American population and make up a large proportion of it. This portion of humanity had to take a long time passing through the period between death and a new birth because of the distinctive nature of their oriental culture and you can say that they are old souls. They are born in America into bodies in which they don't, they don't really feel at home, which they tend to observe more from without than experience from within. This is the reason for their marked inclination to regard life in external ways. The strange paradox we find here is that these souls who lived in the Orient, who had as yet not encountered Christianity but possessed a refined spiritual culture, now live in American bodies. One isolated phenomenon can illustrate what the effect of this has been. The Oriental was drawn to the spiritual nature of the world, and now, when these souls reappear again in America, they develop an affinity with the world of spirit again, and yet this has become abstract, is no longer inwardly alive. In earlier eras, thus in former incarnations, such experience of the world of spirit was connected with a neglect of or lack of engagement with the physical world, a disinclination to attend to it. This resurfaces in a decadent form in adherents of Christian science, who deny the reality of matter, do not wish to consider it. It is, something, it is, it is somewhat like worshipping an old, once-living spirituality but doing so now in a more deadened, spiritually corpse-like form. This is only one isolated phenomenon, as I say. But in general we can see in the American outlook that souls are not quite fully at home in their body and therefore wish to take hold of it externally, and that even psychology in America assumes a character that has no proper concept of the I. Capital. In its past incarnation, the soul was more accustomed to sensing itself in a super-earthly realm, and so now the I is not fully incarnated in the West. This gives rise to phenomena such as, quote, association psychology, close quote, in which, rather than developing consecutive trains of thought, a person becomes the plaything of merely associative thoughts. This is something for which one might well employ a term often used to disparage our doctrine of repeated earthly lives, that of, quote, soul wanderings, close quote, or metempsychosis, the idea that souls wander about from one place to another. In fact, we ought not to use such phrases as transmigration in relation to reincarnation, since successive lives on earth involve the soul's evolution and not the mere wanderings we are disparagingly accused of propounding. We could, however, speak of soul wanderings in another sense, in that souls who populate one part of the globe in one life 
will, in their next incarnation, choose a quite different geographical location. Thus we find that souls who incarnated in southern lands in the early Christian centuries are now living in a new incarnation in central western and eastern Europe, living further north, but that in these regions too, at the same time, live souls who once inhabited the bodies of Native Americans. In Asia we find souls who lived in Europe during the migration period, and also before and after this. And in America are souls who lived in Asia at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. A time certainly is approaching when people will start to yearn for insight into the full nature of reality. Today there is fierce opposition to an holistic view of things, not only in theoretical fields, but also in ordinary life. The disease of intellectualism is something I have repeatedly referred to from all kinds of angles as an infatuation with Wilsonism. In many lectures, including public ones, I have had harsh things to say about this infatuation of much of humanity with Wilsonite principles. These doctrines are also a manifestation of something, though here in a very abstract form, that has gradually arisen through the nineteenth century as the outward consequences of materialism and social science, the principle of nationalism, this hammering on about nationality and the desire to embrace nothing but this principle. This stands in stark opposition to principles governed by spirit and soul which regard nationality as of little concern. Many of the souls living in Europe today formerly inhabited America, and the souls today largely living in Japanese bodies ought not to seek the origins of their psyche in their ancestors, but in people living in Europe during the migration period. And Americans, in turn, should relinquish their pride in their forefathers their blood ancestors or forebears in Europe, but ought instead to direct their gaze to Asia, where they lived at the time of the mystery of Golgotha, in a culture as yet untouched by Christianity, discovering that they are only now approaching excuse me, that they are only now appropriating Christianity in the form of outward tradition and upbringing. This group too displays a fierce opposition to a view of the world founded on spirit and soul. This materialism is apparent not only in academia and science, but also in ordinary culture. Aims for a new Europe, for redrawing the map of Europe, are very much shaped by materialistic feelings and impulses. Humanity will only awaken when it augments these nationalistic impulses, which are materialist ones, and are based only on consideration of a physical succession of generations, with a true sense of historical and social reality. We must develop an eye, EYE, also for the souls living in bodies today. We must see that the latter are only an outward vessel of physical heredity through the generations, and that the prevailing culture is something handed down by tradition and merely adopted or appropriated by upbringing and education. Below the surface of awareness, People do have a longing to go beyond what a merely materialistic outlook can offer them. While real spiritual investigation reveals things that will often seem paradoxical to them compared with their accustomed trains of thought, they will discover if they have a true eye for life, modern life especially, which is so fraught with adversities, that much becomes comprehensible to them if they attend carefully to the precise and conscientious findings of spiritual science. People are used to giving credence to findings released, say, by observatories. Whenever some discovery is made in astronomy, people do not feel they are merely taking such a finding on trust. In fact, they are doing so, but they are unaware of this. And anyway, they also bring their healthy human common sense to bear on such discoveries, and their capacity to discern whether or not the information they receive in this way is to be trusted or not. They form their own judgments about 
whether what they hear is reasonable and therefore whether it can be relied upon and has a true foundation. Here circumstances are such that we really cannot talk of taking anything merely on authority. We ought to respond to the discoveries of reliable spiritual researchers in the same way as to those of reliable astronomers, and likewise disseminate the findings of spiritual research. If we will only use our healthy common sense, we will find that life itself confirms the truth of such discoveries. Anthroposophic spiritual science would remain merely theoretical and removed from human life if it did not permeate all life's manifold realms. It would be wrong to imagine, for instance, that spiritual science ought only to cast a slightly broader light on history, yet leave history itself basically the same as a history of successive generations. No. Spiritual insights themselves must be combined with external accounts of historical events to produce a full picture. Opposition to a view of life that accords with full reality is as strong today in the conscious areas of human life as the yearning for it is in unconscious depths. This opposition has recourse to everything possible in an effort to seemingly justify its tenets. It does not shy away from slander of all kinds. Yesterday I mentioned an example to show how untruthful this opposition becomes, how it tells downright lies, objective untruths. It really does not matter that such attacks are launched on anthroposophic spiritual science. What is important here is to discern the human traits that become apparent when someone with an impressive Ph.D. after his name a doctor of theology, has so little regard for the truth that he fails to write, Someone told me that he saw an image of Christ in Dornach whose upper countenance has luciferic attributes while its lower part bears animal features. In fact, the head in question has ideal features. The sculpture's upper part is largely complete, but the lower part is still just a lump of wood. Instead, he writes that the figure's lower countenance shows animal features. This is so morally base that one is very much inclined to ascribe his lack of moral probity to the whole academic world that he represents, whose veracity can scarcely be any better. On the other hand, even when they want to make positive comments, people who have no wish to engage with the realm of spirit but instead stick to abstract concepts, end up going down strange cul-de-sacs. A contemporary, Count Hermann Kaiserling, has made efforts to construct a worldview from the empty husks of arid concepts and has met with an enthusiastic response in some quarters. If you try to get anywhere with his empty, abstract husks of meaning, you will be hard-pushed to do so. He is a widely read man, but his writings are devoid of any real content. He also criticizes and disparages the anthroposophic worldview. Naturally, the empty shavings of his phrases don't make much of an impact, and he is therefore obliged to resort to untruths if he wishes to say anything positive. Anyone who has read my books will be aware that my point of departure in the 1880s was Goetheanism, specifically Goethe's writings on science. My response to Haeckel, on the other hand, was not intrinsic to my early reflections. Count Kaiserling is, therefore, lying when he says that my whole outlook is founded on Haeckel, and here he simply overlooks my real point of departure. Numerous such falsities can be found in a great many well-read and erudite men of our day. When they try to say something positive, they have to speak falsehoods for otherwise they simply expend themselves in hot air. We would find ourselves in really very murky terrain if we wish to explore further the real nature of opposition to anthroposophic spiritual science. But let us look at things from the other perspective for a moment. This is one of the oldest branches of the Anthroposophical Society, having been founded many years ago. 
things developed here in more or less the same way as elsewhere. Let us just consider for a moment how this was. Taken up only by small groups initially, anthroposophic science of the spirit has only ever cautiously approached those who wish to engage with it and never sought to impose itself. You see, its tasks are not regarded in the same way as those of public campaigners. Instead, the tasks of the spiritual scientific movement are taken up within the world of spirit, and irrespective of whether one has a larger or smaller number of followers, one knows that these tasks are spiritual ones, and that although they must take effect in the earthly domain, they are certainly first perceived within the world of spirit. If you reflect further on these things, you will see how little has been done in the way of seeking public attention by outward means. Public lectures were given, that is all. People can attend these, can feel drawn to what is said there, or put off by it. They can also stay away if they don't like what they hear. In no way has any attempt been made to impose anything on people or become strident. Nor can it be said that we have disseminated our literature in an especially insistent way. The Philosophic Anthroposophic Publication Company we founded has not sought out, sought out the ordinary retail outlets for books, but has chosen a quieter means of reaching its readership. A great proportion of our publications are not even destined for public consumption and have only reached the public domain by illegitimate means. The priest, Father Cully, in Arlesheim, possesses all these lecture cycles, but I am quite sure he did not obtain them by the proper route. And many others have got hold of them wrongfully. The fact that our movement has gradually grown to be a large one, and that it is now spreading rapidly, is not something we sought to achieve by any ordinary kind of campaigning. We can study things in detail here. Several Protestants and Protestant priests have found that they no longer get very far with the ideas that Protestant theology provides. They become familiar with the anthroposophic worldview, since anthroposophy was gaining ground everywhere, and began to write about the disparities between their approach as Protestants and the anthroposophic worldview. The opposition which then arose between them and other Protestant priests and also university professors, uh, Traub, for instance, was initially just an internal debate or dispute, and we became the victims, you can say, of what these people had to settle between themselves. The opposition we have been encountering is really caused by disagreements between members of a group that has nothing to do with us. Of course, this culminates in an attack on us. It's obvious. Anyone who wishes to study the unfolding course of these internal events will find that we ourselves never launched any kind of attack on anyone. We did not attack the Protestant priests, nor did we make any effort to propound anthroposophy in circles that remain faithful to the Protestant Church. Where we do engage in public works, we conduct ourselves in a different way. In the Walder School, the Catholic pupils receive religious instruction from the Catholic priests and the Protestant pupils from the Protestant priest. We only offer non-denominational religion lessons to people who wish this. We have not established any kind of faith school. The conflict now developing around us is really due, therefore, to us faithfully expressing what spiritual realities oblige or allow us to say. The disputes and conflicts now attributed to us have in fact been transplanted onto us from other quarters. People seem inclined to seek the fault in the anthroposophic movement itself rather than putting their own houses in order. A proper examination of the facts would be very instructive, especially as regards the battle now being fought amongst Protestant priests. You can be quite sure that initially there was no opposition to us from Protestant priests. This opposition only surfaced when Protestant priests felt dissatisfied with their own theology and decided to join us. It is this that caused opposition. 
And then along came figures such as Herr Traub in Tübingen and find it a profitable venture to write books about me personally. There's a market for such books. The anthroposophic movement is now so large that you can do good business by writing books about it. But one ought to more carefully study the way these battles are conducted and especially the cause of the conflicts raging around anthroposophy. A rigorous eye will discover the disharmonies in contemporary worldviews and schools of thought, and will see that anthroposophy itself cannot, in fact, incite opposition in this way at all, but seeks only to realize its mission as entrusted to it by the world of spirit. Adversarial texts of various kinds have been written merely out of hatred by some who were members of the anthroposophic movement for a while, who sought flattery for their personal egos and proved themselves of no worth for the movement. It would be very interesting, too, to study underlying connections here. A while back, someone in Switzerland, in lectures that he gave, launched fierce attacks against anthroposophy and on me personally. Among other things, this man stated that his aim is to be rigorously scientific, whereas anthroposophy is unscientific fantasy. He himself then went on to relate all kinds of tall stories. While our opponents accuse us, excuse me, while our opponents accuse of us dwelling in illusions, it is they themselves who live in a fantasy world. But let us for a moment leave to one side this gentleman who lambasted me in anthroposophy in Switzerland, while I tell you another story. About thirteen or fourteen years ago, when I was in Frankfurt giving a series of lectures, a man came to see me in the hotel where I was staying. This fellow talked nineteen to the dozen for a while, telling me he had been following me about about wherever I went, but had never before got the chance to speak to me in person. He was pleased to have finally cornered me, and seemed very keen to join forces with the anthroposophic movement. I could see he was a pure dabbler, a charlatan. These things often happen, and invariably one has no alternative other than to send such people packing when they approach you out of personal vanity and ambition. And now, you see, this was the same man who has been speaking out against us so vociferously in Switzerland. He kept a low profile for a few years, and then launched his attacks. Things are very often like this. One just has to trace them and will discover that opposition to anthroposophy often draws on such murky waters. By contrast, we need to draw from a source that offers us a picture of the world which humanity needs today and in forthcoming times, which younger people need especially today, since they just won't be able to survive by resorting to outmoded worldviews. We can draw strength, for instance, from a view of history that extends it by speaking of souls as well as of physical ancestry. And we should seek the strength to stand up for anthroposophy wherever we can. Anthroposophy will be best served by those who stand up for it. The opposition we have been encountering will not lessen, will not assume milder forms in future. On the contrary, it will manifest in ever more strident and severe forms. Those who become fully aware of what anthroposophy can give will also find ground under their feet through such awareness and will be able to work in harmony with it whatever their place in the world. You see, what is achieved by anthroposophical work is not in the least concerned with personal goals but with the good of all humanity. Let us not be cowed by fear at the ever-increasing opposition and enmity we encounter, nor by its grubby nature, which is set to grow a good deal more grubby and deceitful as time goes on. If we lose courage in the face of such attacks, then we have not in fact properly understood what anthroposophy means for humanity's future evolution. With these final words today I wanted to draw your attention to something we should be aware of within our movement and relate it to important observations we made today concerning the soul's progress through successive lives on earth and the way in which our human organism 
draws on two converging aspects of the wide universe and the earth. The ordinary scientific community knows so little about these things. It has confined itself to studying merely the outermost image of the powers that are in fact at work, the outer blastodermic and inner blastodermic layer, for instance, without knowing the macrocosmic significance of the outer cotyledon and the telluric significance of the inner inner cotyledon, and how these things are in turn connected to thinking and will. Without considering these connections, a materialistic outlook takes account of externalities only, the least externalities. And it does so too in regard to history, which it sees only in terms of the generational bloodline and the traditions that develop in any particular place alongside this ongoing stream of descent, of descent. The whole picture of reality can only be acquired, however, by looking beyond the type of blood flowing in a person's veins and instead asking where the soul originates that is only served by this blood. We must seek a holistic view of reality, of humanity, for this will help the world to progress and will do so more and more. This is what anthroposophy aims to do. Well, that is what I wish to say to you today. I hope we will see each other again soon and continue our reflections, seeking to understand the present era and the future and the totality of human nature, to understand the universe out of which we are born.